Good morning. This is the Keeping It Real Sunday School class from Cornerstone Baptist Church in Richland, Missouri. I'm Dr. Max Thornsbury and I'm the teacher and my wife Brenda will be reading the scriptures this morning from the authorized version of the Bible, the original King James. She's actually got the new King James, but I don't let her put in the new words if I can keep from it. We're going to be looking at probably one of the most frustrating lessons I've dealt with in many, many Sundays. Not because of the material that's contained in it, but because the lesson writer has put a PhD thesis into this lesson with over 50 cross-referencing verses. There isn't any way in the world that I can do justice to this today, but we're going to do our very best. It's going to be a longer lesson because I can't do it all without it being longer. So I'm going to start out right off the bat and tell you the premise of the lesson, and then if you want to continue to listen to all of the uh, conclusions and verses and responses to verses, I'd feel pleased if you would. This is a letter written to the region of Galatia, which is the northern part of what we would call Turkey today. It's part of the Roman Empire. It is in Asia. It is not in Europe. Thessalonica, Corinth, they're in Europe. This is still in Asia, Middle Asia. Um, Judaizers had moved into the region. That is, Jews had followed up the Apostle Paul and convinced those people that had become Christians that in order to be a real Christian, you had to keep the Law of Moses. That it was evident in your life if you weren't keeping the Law of Moses, and then if you weren't a Jew first, you couldn't be a Christian. Apostle Paul has written this letter to address those issues. And in the process, there are some very confusing verses here. There are verses that are very alarming, very alarming. And you remember that this is the inspired Word of God under the influence of the Holy Spirit directed to a specific region that is undergoing some, well, real issues. Someone comes in behind you. The Apostle Paul says you got liberty in Christ. Someone comes in behind him that has a lot of authority. Maybe he comes from Jerusalem. He's a big Jew. He's a Pharisee. He comes and says you can't be a Christian unless you keep the law. So the Apostle Paul addresses this in Galatians chapter 3 when he says, O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you that you should not obey the truth, before whose eyes Jesus Christ has been evidently set forth crucified among you, and evidently set forth is what the Apostle Paul had preached to them. Brenda, if you would turn to Galatians chapter 3, I want you to read verses 6 through 11. Even as Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Know ye therefore that they who are of faith, the same are the sons of Abraham. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. So then they who are of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is every one that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them but that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God. It is evident, for the just shall live by faith. Now the just shall live by faith is Habakkuk 3, 4. Excuse me, Habakkuk 2, 4. Um, notice that the Apostle Paul says that if you intend to go back and keep the law, that the law is a curse unto man, no man can keep the law, but if you decide that's what you want to do, you have to keep it all. Mm -hmm. We have the same thing going on in Christianity today. People that want to go back to the law, observe the feast, observe the holidays, observe the dietary constraints, and yet they don't want to keep all the law because that would be quite a, quite a trick to do that, wouldn't it? Mm -hmm. But the Apostle Paul plainly says that if you're going to do this, you must keep it all. Mm -hmm. That comes out of Deuteronomy. I believe it's 2726 is where that particular verse is, that if you're going to do the law, you have to do it all. No man can keep the law. Mm -hmm. The law is a curse unto man. Why is it a curse? It's the perfection of God, right? 
The only person that ever kept the law was the Lord Jesus Christ. He kept it all and every little punctuation point in it, every jot and tittle. Um, but we cannot keep it. It's not possible for us to keep it. So what does it do? It points to our shortcomings. Mm -hmm. points to our need to put our faith and trust in Christ. And once we put our faith and trust in Christ, we're freed from the law. Mm -hmm. So let's start reading in Galatians chapter 5, um, verse 16 through 18, as the Apostle Paul continues to build upon this argument. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh it lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that you would. But if you be led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now, I want you to turn, Brenda, to two verses that indicate the Apostle Paul believes what he has written. He believes it. He has written it down. He has taught it. And I want you to turn to Timothy chapter 1 to verse 15 first. Then we're going to go to Romans chapter 7. 1 Timothy chapter 1. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15. This is a faithful saying, and worthy of all acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. Now the Apostle Paul is saying he's the chiefest of sinners among you. Mm -hmm. I'm the chiefest of sinners among you. What does that mean, the chiefest of sinners? Well, he's saying that he, um, you think you're a sinner? I'm a bigger sinner than you are. <laughs> which okay. doesn't seem, you know, which seems really odd to All us. Right. I want you to turn to Romans chapter 7 and read verse 13 through 25, please. Romans 7, 13 through 25. What then... That which is good may death unto me, God forbid. But sin, that it might appear sin, worketh death in me by that which is good, that sin by the commandments might become exceedingly sinful. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For that which I do under I for that which I do I understand not. For what I would, that I do not, but what I hate, that I do. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. Now then, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but for to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. For the good that I would, I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do. Now if I do that I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind, and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin." Are there Christians that have committed adultery? Uh, yeah. Are there Christians that are alcoholics? Yes. Are there Christians that have been involved in drug abuse? Yes. So, sin does not make you not a Christian. That's right. Apostle Paul makes that very plain here, does mm -hmm. he not? Mm -hmm. But if we allow the Spirit to live in us, we should not dwell in sin. Mm -hmm. What do you think the Apostle Paul means here when he uses this term, the flesh? Well, the flesh is the human part of us. We're body, soul, and spirit. And the flesh is, is the human part of us, the body part of us that wants to please itself, the flesh, no matter, no matter what. Yep. You know? 
And the good and I want to do, I do not, and that, and that which I do I not want to do, that, that I, do. I do. I know, yeah. It's, it's a constant battle. So what, what is going to change that in a Christian? What's going uh, to bring about a change that would allow you not to let the flesh have complete control over you? Well, the thing to do would be to um, listen to the Holy Spirit, because you have the Holy Spirit living within you, would be to listen to the Holy Spirit and do what He says to do rather than what your flesh wants to do. But that's the battle. It is. Did He not say, I'm, I'm in a battle here? Yeah. I'm a battle between the spirit man and the fleshly man. Mm-hmm. Is that a, when's that battle going to end, Brenda? When we breathe our last. And we die. Mm-hmm. He says, the only time you're not going to sin is when you're dead. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks right. a lot, the yeah. Apostle Paul. Yeah. Thanks How encouraging. A lot. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Well, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time there in Romans because our lesson comes out of Galatians chapter 5. I do want you to read Romans 8, 28. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose. Now, you read it right that time. The called. He goes on down in the next few verses to explain who the called are. Who are the called? Those who have accepted Jesus Christ as and our And they are Lord predestined to eternal yeah. life. Yeah. Now, we are not five-point Calvinists in the sense we believe that you're born saved or born lost. And one of the reasons I'm not, um, if you look on down through here, he says, For whom he did foreknow, we also did predestinate. Mm -hmm. Predestination starts at the point of salvation. What did Peter say? The Apostle Peter said, It's God will that none perish, mm -hmm. but all come to a saving. So there's predestination and there's free will. Your free will is you reject Christ or accept Him. And then once you accept Him, now you're predestined. You're not yours anymore. Yeah. You're Christ. You're not your own. You're saved with a precious price. So there is a, a somewhat misunderstanding who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us, who shall separate us from the love of Christ. Shall tribulation or distress, persecution or famine, nakedness or peril or sword? No. No. As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. This life we're in is a battle. It is a struggle. It is a fight. Mm -hmm. And we're going to fight it till we die. Yeah. This battle between the flesh seeking to satisfy itself and the spirit seeking to live after the direction of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. So let's... Uh, I want to touch on just a couple of things. If you be led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. Yet we have Christians today, Brenda, that want to be under the law. Can you explain that to me? Well, no, I can't. I don't think it's very smart myself. I don't know why you would put yourself into any kind of bondage, which, you know, if I, if I had to, I don't know, spend my life marking off all the special days and the Feast. And the feast and all those kind of things. I those it would were, drive me nuts. Those are all put in the law to point you to Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Jesus Christ has come. He's died. He's been buried. He rose from the dead. Mm -hmm. He has ascended into heaven, sitting at the right hand throne of God as your intercessor. Mm -hmm. The law is over. Yep. It's completed in Christ. Now, are there things in the law we should abide by? Yeah, our t Ten Commandments, our whole legal system comes from the law. Um, but we are not bound to keep dietary constraints. We're not bound to observe the feast and the festivals and all the other things that are pointing to the Lord Jesus Christ. We now have Him. Mm -hmm. Exactly. We now have Him. So anyway, um, I wanted to touch on one thing. He says, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. What, what do you think this term, walk in the Spirit, means? Um, I think it means um, 
kind of like some of the other, like pray without ceasing, where you don't walk around praying all the time. I mean, but you're in an attitude if something comes up that needs prayer, it's not a um, not an unusual thing to you to stop and pray. I think it's kind of similar with walking in the spirit. Um, when you have decisions to make that are uh, consequential, go to th go to the the Lord in prayer through the Holy Spirit and song. ask Him. Yeah, no, 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 no. Or what? there's no other way. No, but please. Okay. There was no call for that, <laughs> but. What, you, this, what I'm saying is, yeah, you be this, in an attitude yeah. of when you when you come up to a stop sign. I don't need to ask the Holy Spirit. Should I stop at the stop yeah. sign? Yeah. I mean, you know, there are, are certain things that you do, but there are other things that the Holy Spirit can guide you and direct you in, and you should ask for that. And I guarantee you, you will get the answer. You will know. You'll know that you know. Yeah. Um, this walk is uh, a term that identifies, like you just said, pray without ceasing, a lifestyle. Mm -hmm. A lifestyle of looking to the Spirit to be your guide and director. Yeah. Um, Galatians 5, 19 through 21, please. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, sorcery, Hatred, strife, jealousy, wrath, factions, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and the like, of which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they who do such things shall not inherit the kingdom now, of God. this seems to be a paradox, Brenda. There's a big long list of things here, which mm -hmm. we'll touch on just briefly. But it says here... Those that do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. And yet the Apostle Paul has just told us, told Timothy, I'm the chiefest sinner among you. He's just said the good I want to do, I do not. And that which I don't want to do, that's what I find myself doing. Is that a paradox? No, I think uh, these um, listed in 20 and 21 are a, there again, it's, it's a lifestyle of right. doing exactly those kind of things right. over and over that and over walk and thing, over. If you find yourself in a lifestyle of these things, not a sin in a moment of weakness, but if you find yourself in a lifestyle, that you better question your salvation. Mm -hmm. Because if you're saved, if you're going to inherit the kingdom of God, you won't be involved in these things as a lifestyle. Right. Does that make sense? Yes. Let's talk about some of these. Some of them are fairly obvious. Adultery, fornication, this uncleanliness and lasciviousness um, are others leading back to sexual immorality. Um, idolatry, any kind of idol, what the Apostle Paul says, don't give place to the devil mm -hmm. in Ephesians. Um, witchcraft, I want to dwell on a little bit because the Greek word for that is pharmakopoeia. So what do you think of when you hear the word pharmacopoeia? Think of drugs. Yeah, because what the witches did is they had a, a very firm understanding of herbal medicine. And they also could conspire, or not conspire, but compounds of various drugs. Um, you know what they were used primarily for? To cast spells, to develop potions, and as an abortifacient. Mm-hmm women came to them to abort their babies. Yeah. And they gave them these toxic substances that killed the baby and caused a miscarriage. This is a prime indication that the Apostle Paul is dead set against that. You'll also remember in the book of Ephesians that, uh, well, let's just turn there, Brenda, right quick. Uh, Let's turn to, let's see here, Acts 19. Acts 19. Yeah, I'm, I'm, it's about Ephesus, but it's in the book of Acts. Um, remember in Ephesus, he said, do not give place to the devil, things that they do in darkness you shouldn't even talk about. Well, Acts 19 defines what happened when people became Christians that were involved in witchcraft. So Acts chapter 19, 
uh, verse 19. Many of those also who used magical arts brought their books together and burned them before all men, and they counted the price of them and found it 50,000 pieces of silver. Now, I said last week it was one to two million dollars. If you take an ounce of silver today and you bought it on the open market, it would be about 30 bucks an ounce, 20 bucks an ounce would be on the low end. So if you did that times 50,000, that's a million to a million and a half dollars worth of dark arts, magical arts books that they had in Ephesus that they used for these things, for potions, for casting spells, for witchcraft, for pharmacopoeia. And as these Christians got saved, they burned these things up, and mm -hmm. they did it publicly. Mm -hmm. They counted the cost, in other words. Mm -hmm. And um, so this witchcraft was a very... Uh, a significant issue. Um, I'm not going to address every one of these. You can look these up yourself in a commentary, but envying, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. It's not an um, exhaustive list and such like, you understand? Mm -hmm. But a couple of things um, as we look at these words. Emulations. Emulation is uh, a feeling of indignity because you envy someone. You'll notice in the book of Acts that the Apostle Paul mentioned that the Jews were envious of him because of the crowds of people that came to listen to him. Mm -hmm. That's emulations. Uh, an envy of something that you don't have. Um, wrath is um, um, wrath is almost like anger, but really wrath is where you look at somebody and it really goes back more to envy, where you wish bad on someone because they have something you don't. Mm -hmm. Maybe they have a talent you don't have. Maybe they're a stronger Christian than you. Um, strife is something that happens in the church, and Paul used this in a letter to the Philippians about, he used the same word, but he, it's mentioned in English as contention um, about the affliction of his bonds. The fact that he was in prison, he's writing this letter, people were making fun of him because he was in prison. If he's a really a Christian, God would have him out of prison. An angel would come and deliver him, you know, like he did mm -hmm. in Philippi. Mm -hmm. But, um, and then seditions or divisions, heresies. <coughs> um, we don't often talk about heresies anymore, but a heresy is something that teaches a belief or a teaching that is unbiblical, mm -hmm. that cannot be backed up with Scripture. We have that going on today when we have churches allowing women to be pastors. Um, people that are ordaining people that are in sexual sin mm -hmm. or in the ob in obvious understanding of sexual sin, not removing that person from from the pulpit after that sexual sin is discovered. Mm -hmm. um, that That is heresy. So what do you think envying is, Brenda? Well, didn't we just kind of go over that? Something, yeah. looking at somebody, what somebody else has, and it's not a matter of, gosh, I hope I make enough money someday to, to get one of those two. It's looking at them and saying, they shouldn't have that, and I should. Drunkenness is something you, feel, you find mentioned quite a bit by the Apostle Paul. He said back in the lesson we had just la last week, uh, do not be drunk with wine, which is excess, but be ye filled with the Spirit. Um, these things that they had were alcoholic. You had to use... Uh, John MacArthur's got a really good YouTube video on the amount of alcohol that was in the various things the Jewish nation drank. And now we're out of the Jewish nation right now, which were very low alcohol content. Now we're into the Roman Empire, the Greek uh, culture. They tried to get just as much alcohol in there as they could. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, that's about 13% alcohol, maybe 14%. Uh, in natural fermentation, the alcohol content gets high enough that it kills the yeast. And you don't have to drink very much of something that's 14% alcohol to get drunk. I've seen executives of multi-million dollar companies make an absolute fool out of themselves at a business meeting after they drank a quart of wine. Mm -hmm. I had one I had to drive home. Yeah. Sure did. This is a CEO of a company. Um, we're not supposed to do that. Now, I'm not going to say we're forbidden to take a drink of wine or have a beer, but we're not to get drunk, which is excess. 
I think it's better just to leave it all alone. You don't lose your witness on that, right? Mm -hmm. You don't have to worry about your conscience then because you're not participating. Brenda, read Galatians 5, 20 through, through, through 25. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, self-control. Against such there is no law. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections of, and lust. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Brenda, I'd like us to go back to the book of Matthew and look at the actual words of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. He is using a metaphorical representation here that has really been misunderstood and hard to really comprehend and understand. And if I could find the reference, I'd tell you. Matthew 16, verse 24 and 25, please. Matthew 16, verse 24 and 25. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself, and take up his cross, and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. Now, Brenda, does that mean that we need to make us a rough-hewn cross out of an old oak and carry it around with us? Um, no. Arthur Blessed did that, carried it all over the country. He did, he did. And then he got in big trouble by having an affair. Yeah, well. Um, this is a metaphorical, how about that for a big word, Brenda? That is a big word. Mrs. Traw would be absolutely ecstatic with me right she, now. Would she? Yeah. I know she would. Oh, yeah. I can see her right now saying, good job, Max. Mm -hmm. Metaphorical. Yeah. What's that mean? Uh, well, it's, it's using something, t um, one thing to make a point about something else. Yeah, and, it, and it's not meant to be taken literally, be, is it? Yeah, no, it's figurative. Um, I could eat a horse. Yeah. Um, you know, things like that. Obviously, you're not going to eat a horse, and you're not hungry enough to eat a horse. Mm. But we'll use a, a metaphor, metaphor in the Ozarks. <laughs> no. We'll use a metaphor <laughs> to draw attention to what we are, because God is full of literary references. He uses all these literary references to emphasize and stick in our brain what he's talking about. Mm -hmm. Now, are we then spiritually going to have to take up the cross of Christ? Well, um, we do every to, day, do we not, Brenda? Yeah, when we I've don't walk in the flesh, when we do not conform to what the world says we should conform to, when the Apostle Paul writes to Timothy and says, those who seek to live righteously in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Yeah, and if the world hated Jesus, he's going to hate us. The world hated me, it's going to hate you. Yeah. So um, it's more than just metaphor. It's, it's reality mm -hmm. in a spiritual sense. And it may even be in a physical sense in some locations, in sure. some cultures. Sure. So... Um, when he says, and they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the afflictions and lusts thereof. If we live in the Spirit, let us also work in the Spirit. The Apostle Paul is trying to draw um, a literary reference to this, that if we are Christians, we'll not find ourselves in witchcraft. We'll not find ourselves with a Buddha sitting on the mantle. We'll not find ourselves drunk. We'll not find ourselves envying and in strife and seditions and variances, and, and we'll not find ourselves preaching or advocating heresies that cannot be backed up with Scripture. We have churches in our hometown right now that are preaching heresy. Total inclusiveness. Anything you want, come on in. We'll take everybody. We love everybody. Well, we love everybody too, but what did Jesus say to the woman caught in adultery? Go and sin no more. That's not loving them, endorsing their sin. No. Um, approving of their sin. Well, um, what do you think this term peace means, Brenda? Uh, well, it's not the absence of war, which is what people kind of tend to think. When we think of terms of peace, we think that uh, that means no war. Uh, it means having a... Um, a calm spirit, maybe within the storm. Let's, you let's, can be peaceful in the storm. You can be. Um, 
And it can be quite unusual that in times of great calamity and difficulty, how much peace you can actually have the Holy Spirit gives it to mm -hmm. you. Um, I've been in some bad accidents, and some of that is hormonal, your body trying to... But I've had such great peace about the things that have happened, even though, you know, when that cow mashed the heck out of my hand, I lost a finger. Um, everybody said, well, how can you be so calm? I said, well, what can I do to change it? Mm -hmm. You know, it's over, it's done. Partly my stupidity, partly the fault of that cow, and maybe some demonic activity involved. But what can I do about it now? I have to give God the glory. It's changed my life, literally. Mm -hmm. Turn, Brenda, to John 14 and read verse 27, please. John 14, 27. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Now he's saying these words, Brenda, to a group of men. The Apostle Paul's not in this group. Um, Judas is going to commit suicide and hang himself. All of the rest of these men, save one, John the Apostle, are going to be martyred for Christ. Every one of them. Bartholomew, Matthew, James, first one martyred, Herod killed him with the sword. Um, how can you take such a verse like that, knowing exactly what happened to these people? Well, um, again, it's something that you have to, you have to work on a Not daily basis. I mean, if you, if, if I were to uh, just concentrate on all the things that are wrong. Well, I made a list the right other now. day of all the things wrong with me and why you stayed with me through them all. I got I, about I had, 14 things wrong with me. Yeah, I had great I had great peace about that though. <laughs> to stay with you. <laughs> I mean, you could everybody you, do that. Could every, you? You could go back and yeah, and I, take the, a, the part of the, a tally of your life and just go, why did this happen? Why did that happen? You know, you can't live like that, can you? No, and uh, the last part of that verse um, is something you you need to remind yourself that I need to remind myself of often. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. And what have we, especially over the last couple of years, what have we been told? Oh, you must be afraid oh, of this. Yeah. You have don't to be afraid of, of this. Don't you know? Wrap your kids in bubble wrap. Uh, don't let them uh, Can't go, go to out. School. Yeah. And so the whole thing, that's when I, it was, didn't take me very long at all when all this started to say, this is not from God. Mm. They're not, this is not for our protection. This is fear. And that's when I decided. Not biblical. Not going to listen to you. <laughs> <laughs> it's not biblical. Not biblical. Colossians 3, verse 14 and 15, please. And then we're going to close. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also you are called in one body, and be ye thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, in all wisdom teaching and admonishing one another, in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with the grace in your hearts to the Lord. That's supposed to be our walk. Mm -hmm. That's supposed to be how we act. Can we expect to be sinless? Absolutely not. Um, if the Apostle Paul says, I'm the chiefest sinner among you, what hope do I have? He's the greatest Christian ever walked the face of the earth. I cannot be without sin. I will not be until I die. Mm -hmm. But I don't have to walk in the flesh. I don't have to walk after these sinful things that he's identified here. Some things I don't have any trouble with. I don't want anything to do with witchcraft. I don't want anything to do with demon worship. I don't want anything to do with voodoo. Those are simple. But... There are other things that you can get involved in. Christians are alcoholics. Christians have abused drugs. Christians have committed adultery. Um, vari variances, having a bad attitude, strife. Those things happen in the church. Mm -hmm. And they're, they are performed and done by Christians. Mm -hmm. 
They need to be addressed. Now, what he says, notice what he says, admonishing one another. What do you think that means? That means making sure that you know and other Christians are subject and other Christians are accountable to what the Word of God says. Mm -hmm. If you choose not to be accountable to the Word of God, then anything goes. Yeah, oh, well, sure. There is no limit. Yeah. There is no limit. And our accountability is to that Word of God and to the Holy Spirit that lives within us to move us, guide us, direct us. What does he say? Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Be ye conformed to the image of Christ. If we could do those things, and if we concentrate on doing those things, these works of the flesh will fall by the wayside. They will not be what we are walking in, mm -hmm. in other words. And I think there's a lot of times there's a difference, Brenda, in the when you're young, 16, 17 year old, maybe sexual fleshly things are something that's a great temptation to you. Mm -hmm. When you get older, those things won't be as much a temptation, but then you get envies, then you get roots of bitterness, then you get variances, then you get heresies. I mean, different times of life, different works of the flesh. Mm -hmm. And they have an impact, they tempt you more, they so if you don't walk in the Spirit, you fulfill the lust of the flesh. Mm -hmm. And if you walk in the Spirit, you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Mm -hmm. Pretty simple, really, isn't it? Simple, but not easy to do. No. That's why it's called sanctification. Mm -hmm. It's a lifetime endeavor. Now, Brenda, I want you to look at 2 Corinthians 10, verse 5. And I am going to end the lesson on that. Sure. <laughs> Trust and obey no, don't sing. For there's no other okay. way To be happy in Jesus But to trust and obey Gosh, you got it in there <laughs> Casting down imaginations <laughs> And every high thing that exalteth itself Against the knowledge of God And bringing into captivity every thought To the obedience of Christ Part of this not walking in the flesh is a process of redirecting our thinking. Mm -hmm. Have you heard that term, stinking thinking? Mm -hmm. <laughs> stinking thinking? Some of that stinking thinking can be going back and saying, well, why'd this happen to me and living in the past? But part of that stinking thinking is not casting down these imaginations, not getting under control in your own life those things that are going to lead you. What did the Apostle James say? God does not tempt any man. Man is tempted when he yields to the lust of the flesh. Mm -hmm. So, we need to assess our walk, make sure that we are not walking in the flesh, that we're walking in the Spirit. And we're going to have to invest the time and discipline to be able to do that properly, Brenda. That's not going to come easy. That's going to be a lifetime's worth of... Um, Nothing but plain old hard work. Now, the Holy Spirit will help us, right? Of course. He said, I'm going to give you peace. My peace I give unto you, not as the world gives you, but as I give you. See you next week.